language. Uh, it's just really Hashtag it, hashtag it, uh, the area Salesforce Developer Group. We've got some other groups here tonight, so feel free to use those hashtags too. I'm not sure what they all are, but you guys probably know. So this is pretty exciting tonight. We've got four groups coming together. Uh, we've never done this before, but it looks like we've got a great turnout. So the Bay Area Salesforce Developer Group usually meets here. And we've got these additional three groups, Metis Data Science, Hey, Doug, why don't you have a show of hands to see what constituents yeah. you know. Okay, Bay Area Salesforce Developer Group, show of hands. Okay. Metis Data Science. All right, Salesforce Data Analytics. Okay. And GraphDB. And who has not put their hand up? <laughs> uh, who has no idea what why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to go through a little bit of the news. We we met earlier this month, so I'm not going to talk much about the news. Uh, but Salesforce just had their quarter two earnings results. They did 2.56 billion revenue, which brings them over their this big goal of many office advertising of a 10 plus billion annual run rate. Uh, so the fastest enterprise software company history to reach that. Um, some of the highlights from their earnings are up here. You can just see their incremental growth over the past few years. Um, this is pretty interesting. Uh, marketing cloud and commerce cloud are the smallest but fastest growing. And then on the other extreme, sales cloud is the largest and slowest growing. But they did really good across the board with all their different clouds. And also around the world, they did really good. So you can see uh, good year-over-year -year growth in America's MEA and APAC. Also, they just uh, announced today some of the key Dreamforce speakers, and Michelle Obama's kind of getting everybody excited, so she'll be a Dreamforce big piece of news there. Uh, just have one job posting. Uh, this is a Salesforce. Uh, there we go. This is a Salesforce ISV evangelist. Uh, Bay Area location, so if you know anybody who's interested in that role, there's the bit.ly link. Um, it's not too bad to take a picture of and type it in, or I'll post the slides later. Uh, if you guys want to know more about what an ISV evangelist does, you can grab me after, after the presentation or have some time. Um, also, we've got some other groups here tonight, so I'd like to just uh, see if any of the other groups want to come up and make any announcements. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Savage. I'm with uh, Metis. We do data science uh, training. Uh, so if any of you guys are interested in getting into the field of data science, we have a 12-week immersive boot camp. Uh, I run the careers side of things, so I get you a job at the end of it. Uh, my colleague Andrew over there, he's one of our instructors, so he can tell you more about the technical details. Uh, in addition to the boot camp, we have night courses, so if you guys are willing to spend your own money, uh, skilling yourself up, you can do that. But we also do corporate training, so you can get your boss to pay for you. Uh, so if any of you guys would like to get more exposure into big data tools like Spark, Hadoop, uh, graphing technologies, visualization, uh, feel free to reach out to any of us. Uh, we'll be in the uh, uh, booth just over this way. Thanks. Hi everyone, um, I'm Corrine, I'm the Community Manager for the Developer Relations team at Neo4j, um, and I designed these awesome shirts, and if you guys want awesome shirts, you know, relationships, it's the relationships between your data, I get it? So if you guys are not familiar with Neo4j, I'm sure Pat will make you very familiar with how awesome and amazing it is and all the capabilities that you can do with it. And it's, it's very good for highly connected data. That's really where like, the best part is. But if you guys want some really cool shirts, you don't just get them. You have to show me something cool that you can create in Neo4j, even if it's just like a little sample project or a sandbox. But um, so anyway, all that aside, um, I did just want to mention we are doing 
a, our Graph Connect conference, um, which we usually hold twice a year. We hold it once in London, um, in Europe, and then we do once in the US, usually San Francisco. But this year, we're actually doing it the first time in New York. Um, so it's a big deal, and it's going to be super awesome. And we have a hackathon around it where we're going to be doing hacks around Neo for good, so good causes. Um, and then there's amazing speakers and all kinds of stuff happening. It's just two days of amazingness and lots of graphs. Um, but we have a discount code, so if any of you guys are interested, it only lasts one week. The deadline is probably written there somewhere when you uh, are putting the code in. But the code is like graphconnect.com is the conference website, and the code is I love graphs. Because we have for some. I love graphs. I love graphs. All caps. You don't have to actually write in all caps, but I would write in all caps. Does that mean? So. Right. <laughs> Anyone else from the other groups have an announcement? No. All right. Well, I'm just going to do a quick introduction here for our guest tonight, Pat Patterson. Maybe uh, some of you know him from the Salesforce days. He was a uh, developer evangelist. I think you built Force TK. I did. And he connected Minecraft to Salesforce. So pretty infamous in the community for that. Uh, he's now with Stream Sets, and he's still still working on Salesforce stuff. But um, I was hoping the Salesforce folks could learn something new tonight, a little bit outside of the ecosystem, and some of the cool things you can do uh, integrating Salesforce platform with other platforms. So that's definitely the guy to tell us about how to do that. Uh, all right, thanks. Uh, maybe give him a little round of applause. You haven't heard me speak yet, so you might, you know. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, um, thank you for the introduction, Daniel. Um, not a lot really I can say about myself. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm now the community champion at uh, StreamSets. I've been there for just coming up to 18 months. So community champion means that uh, I look after our open source community, I write code, um, I write tutorials, I blog, I tweet, I'm just generally, uh, I always say I'm not an engineer, I just play one on Twitter. Um, and if you want, you can fuel my personality cult by following me on Twitter, at MetaDaddy, which is in four locations around the room. This is um, so, yeah, prior to stream sets, I was a... Salesforce developer evangelist for five and a half years, which is was an awesome gig. It really was a great place to, to be. So, what am I going to be talking about? So I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction to stream sets and what we do and some of the core problems we were founded to solve. I'm not going to spend too long on the slides because I really want to get into the uh, technology. Um, and I'm going to explain how I built this integration. So I'm reading data from Salesforce, reading uh, cases and opportunities, and writing them to Neo4j, so a graph database. So unlike Salesforce or Oracle or MySQL that are very much oriented in terms of rows and columns, um, uh, Neo4j <coughs> Uh, works with nodes and edges. So we'll have a look at that and, and what that gives us. And I'm by no means a Neo4j expert. There are Neo4j experts in the room. Ryan, look up, smile. Um, and they can tell you much more about Neo4j, but I can give you a taste of the kind of visualization and analysis that you can do. Um, and uh, if you want to know more, then I'm sure Ryan and Karen as well will be, will be able to tell you. So. Um, has anybody here heard of stream sets before they came to this meetup? Okay. Oh wow. Okay. Anybody using stream sets? Not yet. Okay. So stream sets was founded uh, by uh, two guys about three years ago. One of them uh, had been at. <coughs> Uh, Informatica. In fact, he was the chief product officer at Informatica. It's probably a familiar name to a lot of people in the 
Salesforce uh, ecosystem. They do a lot of tooling uh, for Salesforce. Um, our other co-founder has been at both Informatica and Cloudera. So the, one of the big Hadoop vendors working in big data. And what they had realized in those positions was that um, the existing ETL tools did not work well in today's world of streaming data and big data. And by big data, I mean data that is too big to fit on a single machine, where you have to have a cluster of machines um, managing your database. So terabytes or petabytes uh, of data. So they found in stream sets, and stream sets really brings together a lot of people who have spent a lot of time in uh, different companies. So I was at Salesforce for five and a half years. We have people from Elastic, Square, Facebook, um, Mappa, one of the other big data vendors. And we have um, a number of Apache uh, committers and um, project management chairs. So we have this strong big data open source ethos. So we've grown over the past uh, three years or so. We now have customers across a whole number of different verticals. And we partner with some of the biggest names in cloud and, and big data. And as I mentioned, uh, open source, our core product that I'll be using is Apache 2 license. You just go download it, start using it, hook it up to your Salesforce org, not your production org. Hook it up to a DE org while you get the hang of it. Um, We've had, uh, actually this is an old slide, we've had uh, over a quarter of a million downloads now, and you know, in part of my mission is figuring out who's using it, so uh, we think about half of the Fortune 100 have downloaded stream sets, so are using it or evaluating it, and those numbers just keep on going. So, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna like labor these slides, I'm just gonna just kind of uh, give you a flavor of uh, the kind of problems we solve. So. One of the core problems is this idea of data drift, and this is really where traditional ETL tools would get hung up. Um, in the, the old world, we were working with um, enterprise uh, databases, data warehouses, with fairly static schema. You know, there was a change process for adding a column to a database, and um, things worked pretty well. Nowadays, we're in the era of big data and fast data, and things are changing constantly. And we know this, like working with Salesforce, um, you get a request to add a field to a custom object, and you can just go do it and test it and deploy it, and it's there. And anybody downstream has to kind of cope with this. So we've seen kind of three, um, three uh, flavors of data drift. Structure drift is the easiest one to understand. So. Um, I add a column to my table, add a new table, something changes, and if you're lucky, your uh, synchronization ETL process breaks, and you know about it, and you can fix it. If you're unlucky, then that data just does not flow, and analysts carry on making, uh, uh, with their an analysis and making assumptions based on incomplete data. Semantic drift is a little bit more insidious. It's where the structure of the database doesn't change, but the meaning of the data has. So for example, maybe uh, up till now you've had five digit US zip codes in your zip code or postal code field, and now you have international customers, you have Canadian postal codes, which are alphanumeric. How many of those downstream tasks are making assumptions about five digits? And finally, infrastructure drift is when we're using um, a lot of tools and upstream infrastructure like web servers and firewalls that we nowadays we ingest those logs for analysis because we can do things like ingest uh, CDN, content delivery network logs, to see who and where are downloading our, uh, our data. For, so maybe downloading binaries we want to do some analysis on. Um, where they're being downloaded from. Well, the CDN networks making changes all the time. You install the new firewall, that log can change. So that's the infrastructure drift that again can just break your um, your processes. So I'm not going to spend much time on it. So where we fit is in this um, 
reading data from logs, devices, screens, applications, and rather than having this schema-driven approach of, okay, I've got to define how everything is on the input and how everything is on the output, we have an intent-driven approach, which says, okay, I want to bring everything across. I need to look at these fields to make a decision whether to filter it out or whatever. But for the most part, I just want the data to keep flowing as things change. Just bring everything that's uh, over there into uh, my uh, Cassandra or Hadoop or wherever because I want it to keep flowing. I don't have time to, for this to stop and have to fix it. So one example that we actually uh, saw with a, a customer one time was they were reading in um, uh, IP addresses, uh, records from their data centers with IP addresses, and one of their data centers upgraded to IPv6. And the result was that that data, those IPv6 addresses, looked nothing like a traditional IPv4 you know, dotted, uh, uh, what do you call it, quads? I can't remember, anyway. 206.192.36.45. <laughs> you know, the, the IPv6 addresses are completely different. They were just getting dropped. And the result was that when they were, they were doing analysis, looking at, um, you know, how many of uh, the IP addresses there were and so on, and their data was now bad. The rows were missing IP addresses. They were making, uh, doing analysis on their click-through rate that was now based on faulty data. This, this stuff was just silently being dropped on the floor. And um, analysts, industry analysts, estimate that data analysts spend, um, yeah, about four-fifths of their time just preparing and gathering and validating data before they can even get to the analysis phase of actually drawing conclusions. So, that's why we built StreamSets Data Collector. And you can think of it as, um, it's almost like an IDE for building these data pipelines. You've got data being produced somewhere. So it could be log files, it could be a transactional database, it could be Salesforce. You want to pick it up. Typically you want to do some transformations and then you want to write it somewhere. So you could be writing it to Hadoop. You could be writing it to Einstein Analytics. You could be writing to Neo4j. And it's really a general purpose tool to design these data flows, these pipelines, and then uh, to run them. Now, some of our customers have uh, literally thousands of these data pipelines. We have a major pharmaceutical company as a customer. Uh, pharmaceuticals is a very data-intensive industry. And they, we, we built this tool, Data Flow Performance Manager. So if I go back, so this is a data flow, uh, a pipeline reading from uh, FTP, and it's doing some decision there to select the thing, send the records along one of three paths. So they're going to uh, a high priority Kafka queue, a low priority queue, and a Hadoop file system. So that's one pipeline. Typically, these things feed each other. So I might be reading from FTP, feeding Kafka, the message queue, and uh, which some another pipeline reads from there. So in here, each of those like green boxes with the gear is one pipeline. So we can get an end-to-end -end view of data flowing across the enterprise. And this is this is our vision of data operations, having a handle on where the data is moving around. Anyway. I don't need a conclusion. Oops. Okay. Okay. This is where I go to my. This is where I go to the demo. All right. I have done this before. It's okay. So um, let's start with reading some data from Salesforce. So I have a completely vanilla DE or let me. Uh, oh, that's pretty good. Okay. So what I've done is I've created a very very simple pipeline. So I'm going to be reading data from Salesforce. Now, to avoid sharing my credentials with 50 of my closest friends, um, I'm loading them from files. Um, this is a DE org, so I'm authenticating against login.salesforce.com. 
And what I want to do is both query some data that's there and also subscribe for updates as data changes. So the query I'm doing is actually, let's just do select ID, comma, name. So I'm selecting uh, ID and name from case. So just getting some case data. And um, you'll notice that I can use the bulk or the SOAP API. So bulk API is really good for huge amounts of data, but it's asynchronous. I issue a query, and it kind of can take some time to get back to me. And it's worth it if you're working with like hundreds of thousands of records. The SOAP API is a little bit more uh, immediate for a kind of interactive use. It works really well here with the, the scale of data. And I've got this query that um, I've structured this so that basically if something happens and the pipeline stops, I can pick up from this offset where I, where I was, last was looking at it. So just explaining that. And I'm going to be subscribing to uh, the streaming API, this case that plays. Okay, so let's, uh, let's have a look at how this is going to work. So I'm going to preview this pipeline. So what this does is it goes to Salesforce and just gets 10 records so that I can get a feel for what's going on. And I just screwed something. Oh, cases don't have names. A whole room full of Salesforce people? And nobody said, sued. Try subject. Cases don't have names. What is it, case number? Subject, maybe? I've done that so many times. <laughs> All right, so let me just zoom in on this. So I've got my 10 records back, and this is really nice now, because I can start to uh, introspect my data a little bit. Remember I said this is like an IDE? I can write a query and I get back uh, a record ID, and I can see that that field is length 18, so I'm getting all the metadata. Uh, case number is a string of length 30. So I can start to play around with this. I can start to kind of say, okay, I think I'm getting back something that looks good. Um, one of the nice things I can do, this always really bugged me when I worked at Salesforce, I can do this. <laughs> because what I do is I read the, uh, read the metadata and then uh, I get back everything that you have access to. So I can see everything on the case. And I can, uh, I can also do fun things like, so just because, I can, I can basically do any sockle. So I can do say select ID comma account dot name. Let's have a look at that. I can follow the relationships. So I can have all manner of fun here. But the really, th the really, th the thing I really like about this is that I'm kind of in this preview mode, so um, I can see the data that's coming back. I can see this kind of hierarchical structure. Here I've got the record with the account that has a name, so I've got like two levels of hierarchy. I'm not writing anything anyway yet. I'm still in this preview mode, so I'm still like just um, playing with the data source and, and retrieving it. So. The next thing I'm doing here is I'm evaluating an expression. So what, uh, what happens is when we start receiving updates from the streaming API, this Salesforce CDC type will be created or updated or deleted. And I want to move that into an actual field in the record so I can see it more easily and then write the whole thing to the local file system. So I'm just going to start dropping files into my uh, temporary directory with a timestamp so I can I can see what's going on. So let's read some data. So if I reset the origin, uh, let's change the query, make it select ID, what do we want? Case number, subject, account okay, not name. Alright, so if we uh, we reset already, so if we start it so what it's going to do, and this is a DE org, so there's not a huge amount of data here, but it's going to go and get like the 26 cases that are there, and it's written them somewhere. So if we go, so 
So we go to temp out LS CD 2017 OA 20 edits in English time because so why not? So I've got file there, and if we do tail minus f, so um, that's the last few uh, cases in our file. And you can see I'm writing it in JSON format. I could have written it in CSV or JSON or Avro or any of a number of formats, but I just chose JSON because it's fairly self-describing and human readable. And you can see there we've got the ID, the case number, and again we have this hierarchical structure just as it's coming back from Salesforce with the account name. So, let's go in and uh, mess with something. So, I know case is a service cloud thing, but I just, I'm used to using sales cloud. So, cases. Now if we change this thing and say, okay, we thought this case was closed, but you know what? It's not quite working anymore. What should happen, go here really quickly. That should go to 27. And then over on our text file, we've got the changed record. So, so happens I've set up the, um, uh, the push topic to give me all of the data when anything changes. Um, so you can see in here it says that SFTC operation is updated. And then it's got the, the whole, the status should be there as uh, working. There it is. So status is working. So, so this is really nice. And we can, we can build these uh, pipelines. Um, we could also write data to Salesforce. Um, but what I'm going to do now is look at uh, Neo4j. So, again, very, very simple pipeline, because what I want to do is I want to read all of those case, cases from Salesforce, and I want to write them to Neo4j. And then I also want to read the opportunities and write them as well, plus all of the accounts, contacts, and products to give us a graphical view of the state of our company. So, what I'm doing here is I'm getting much more, so I'm getting, uh, let's see, actually it's probably big enough. I'm getting all the account ID, the name, the contact data, uh, the product, all of that I'm going to put into Neo4j. Now, I need to decide uh, whether or not this is a new record or an updated record because I need to do things a little bit differently in Neo4j. Now, the key to doing this, and the reason, one of the reasons I kind of got this all working was, um, we can write to any JDBC data source. So JDBC is like the Java, what's it, Java database connectivity. It's a way of getting data in and out of just about anywhere. And Neo4j has a driver that supports this, so I didn't have to write any Neo4j custom code. I just said, okay, I'm gonna use JDBC, I'm gonna load this Neo4j driver, and it says SQL query, but actually, this isn't really SQL. Neo4j uses a language called Cypher to manipulate a graph. And so what I'm doing here is saying, okay, for every case, I want to merge this into the graph, and it's going to be identified by the case ID. And then I want to set all these attributes on each case. And then I want to do the same thing with the associated account. And so basically this is creating a bunch of nodes in my graph. And once, um, once all these nodes are created, I can start associating them. So I say, okay, this case is associated with this account, and it's associated with the contact. The account is the parent of the contact. So I can build up this, this thing. So um, it's probably just easiest just to show you this in action now. So here's Neo4j. Right now, if I go to my little cheat sheet, I should have an empty database here. 
All right, so I've got nothing in the database. So if I go and run this, uh, this thing here, so this is where I found cross fingers. Oops. And remember that I need to reset. So one of the features of stream sets is um, it's a continuous system. So once we've read some data in, we keep track of what we've read in. So if you run the pipeline again, it's not going to read anything because nothing's changed. So what I need to do is reset, uh, reset the origin here, throw away that kind of cursor, that marker for the last thing I was reading, and press play. And now, this time, yay. So we've read our 26 records in, we've written them to Neo4j, and now over here, if I go in, I can see I've got a graph. And this is really nice now, because I can, I mean, this is the, the, the feature of a graph database rather than like rows and columns, is that I can start to navigate this and see the connections between different entities. So all my accounts are purple, and my cases are green, contacts are red, products are kind of red. And I can immediately see kind of where, where the busy spots are. Like I can immediately see United Oil and Gas um, has a bunch of cases open. And I can kind of see that there are active contacts, and I can start making uh, queries. Now, not only can I, uh, in Neo4j, I can move around and look at this graph, I can actually run queries and um, uh, do things like, okay, I want, I want to see all the cases that have the new status and their associated accounts. And this is this this is a cipher query that does this. So I want to, and it, it's reasonably self-explanatory. I want to match cases that are associated with accounts where the case status is new. I want the case, the relationship, and the account. So if we do this, this gives me like a subgraph. This gives me a portion of that graph so that I can look at this and see, oh, so Gpoint has one new case, and the United States of Gas have two new cases. And I could get this more tabular view, but I don't know, that's really boring compared to nodes and edges and so on. So I can do I can do other fun things. I can say uh, like get some more um, quantitative data. So I can say okay, give me cases and accounts where the status is closed, and I want the number of cases like in an ordered list. So this isn't that useful here. It's just like nine disconnected accounts. But I now have I can see that. United Oil and Gas has five closed cases, and Grand Hotels has four, and so on. So I can start to um, query the data, manipulate it, and so on. And um, do I have another one here? Oh yeah, I can see, okay. Let's look at from the product side. Um, let's see what products have a, have a load of cases. You know, maybe I've got problematic uh, products. Well. They've all got, each of those four has got one case open, so that doesn't seem like it's going to be a big deal. Now, the really, really cool thing I can do is um, I can make changes in Salesforce now. So maybe, let's see, let's go to Neo4j and get run one of those queries <coughs> and see how many we've got. So maybe um, accounts with the number of closed cases. So if we do that one. All right, so United Oil and Gas has got five close cases. So what we can do is go over here and uh, let's see, let's go from accounts. Uh, just show you everything. You go United Oil and Gas and close cases. And let's see, let's go, uh, let's go mess with it. Okay, let's reopen this case. Okay, now remember, we're subscribed with the streaming API. 
This should go from 26 to 27. It gets written into Neo4j. And then we should be able to just hit up arrow. I'll run that same one again. And now United Oil and Gas has four of those cases. So we can keep the data fresh on the analysis side. So every query we run in Neo4j is working on fresh data. Now, the other really cool thing we can do, um, so we've got the accounts there, and you know, as, as anybody working in Salesforce knows, but to explain to, to everybody else, Salesforce, you know, in its core, the core product is called Sales Cloud, and it's a way of managing um, the companies you're doing business with, the contacts you have at those companies, the deals that you have uh, ongoing with those potential customers, as well as uh, support cases and so on. So this concept of an account is central to Salesforce. It's like, it's like where that uh, sales data and the service data kind of come together. So what I can do is, oh, by the way, I should have said this at the beginning, any questions, feel free to jump in because we've got a lot of concepts going on here. I've got another pipeline where I'm reading the opportunities. So again, I'm reading account ID and account name. And again, I'm uh, creating everything in Neo4j. But the beauty of this merge operation is that if I read the same account in, the same account ID in again, it doesn't create another node. It just uses that existing one. So I'm going to get a, a connection to an existing account rather than just having a load of duplicates. So I can run this pipeline with the opportunities. And I've probably forgotten to reset it, which is what I always do. Okay, always reset the pipeline if you're doing demos. Don't do it in production because then you get duplicate records. Okay, so this is going to read in my opportunities, so again, I should have uh, a couple of dozen, okay, 31 opportunities read in. And now the really neat thing is, if I go to just get uh, the whole, everything in the database. So now, I see I've got these gray opportunities as well as the uh, cases. If I kind of zoom out a bit, I get the big picture. I can see again, United Oil and Gas has a bunch of activity around it. I've got some other uh, customers. But interestingly, I can easily see I've got these disconnected islands. I've got these accounts that have got uh, opportunities, but no support cases. So these are my new customers. So again, the shape of my data is very apparent from this kind of graph view of it. I've got another one down here, here. so uh, a couple of customers there that have got uh, opportunities. And in this case, I brought together data from the two sides of Salesforce. Okay, so I could do these, this kind of analysis that I'm doing right in uh, Neo4j, I could do with SQL queries if I really wanted to. I couldn't get this nice graphical view. But the really nice thing about uh, uh, this kind of integration with, say, stream sets or, or, or other tools is I could have brought in data from Zendesk or uh, any other system. As long as I've got some correlation, I can start to merge it all together in Neo4j and do this kind of analysis. And the same thing's true if you're doing analysis in Cassandra or Hadoop or any other system you can start to join data from very different sources and get the bigger picture. So here we've got um, you know, this, this idea of the sales data in these opportunities and the service data in these cases. And then we can start to do things like, um, so this is, a, this is a really nice one. This is kind of where I'm, I've been going with this. So, So I want to get cases, accounts, and opportunities. I want to get all the cases 
that are not closed. So all the open support cases in the company. And I also want to get the sum of the expected revenue for the, for the opportunities. So basically what I'm saying here is I've got a whole bunch of support cases open. Um, I've got uh, customers that I'm working on, maybe repeat business with, maybe renewals. And I want to know where where's the money? Where is where's my where are my next deals going to come from? Where what support cases those customers have open? Because those are the ones that if I'm going to prioritize, I really want to close those. So those are happy customers. So they uh, we have some repeat business. So like th this is the kind of query. So United Oil and Gas. Oh, they're, they're the big guys in this org. So they've got eight, nearly eight and a half million in expected revenue. Uh, so maybe you know I can go back down here and say, okay, United Oil and Gas. I see these uh, these cases here. These are the ones we've got to be prioritizing. And you know I can support. I can have my support team um, uh, working with my sales team to actually close those down and bring in the revenue. So. That's the idea of joining this data from different places. So, um, go back to the slides. So yeah, Suza's Data Collector, um, as I mentioned, it's an open source tool. It's free to download. Um, we've got, um, there's, you can go to streamsets.com slash community. We have a Google group and a Slack channel. Um, and we really, I mean, my job is to make sure everybody in the community has what they need to get going and start working. Um, it's, we have at least two customers in production with the Salesforce connectors. Uh, one company uh, in education in New York and one uh, insurance company in Europe. So this is production, production stuff. Um, the one in Europe are using, um, are reading, are, they're actually reading cases from Salesforce and building an archive in a relational database, so they've got kind of a backup and they can do some, some, uh, some other work in their, in their, uh, in their RDB. And um, yeah, we can integrate with a whole bunch of data sources, flat files, uh, Kafka, uh, Java message queue and so on. but. Really, this JDBC gives us this in to almost anything. So we could read data out of Neo4j as easily as we can write it in, and a whole bunch of uh, data sources besides. And yeah, really, I mean, I've only really scratched the surface of Neo4j. I mean, one thing that occurred to me um, as I was building this is, um, you know, we, 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 we're on like a sales and support use case in this example. But you could read in uh, users and uh, chat uh, messages. So you could start building a graph of who's chatting with who in the organization and start to see clusters of users talking about particular topics. You could start to say, OK, this user and this user, what's the shortest path between them and people they talk to, and really leverage like the, the unique capabilities of the graph database. This is what it can, it can allow you to do this kind of analysis that's just almost impossible with the relational database. Um, but yeah, so, so Neo4j and graph databases in general offer you a really new way of uh, visualizing data and of building queries and um, manipulating it. So, uh, I'll be really happy, I've kind of, well, we're, we're a little quick, bit faster now, question. so really happy to answer, answer, answer questions. Yeah. Okay, with, uh, uh, did you say you could set up a live data flow to uh, Einstein Analytics as opposed to static? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. So the question was, can you set up a live data flow to Einstein Analytics? So the answer is yes. And what, so what? I, so fair disclosure here, I wrote the Salesforce integration. I said I'm not a real engineer. I just play one on Twitter, but. When I started at Stream Sets, they said, hey, you know the Salesforce APIs, you write this stuff. So what I do is, um, Einstein Analytics, for anybody not who hasn't used it, um, allows you to upload data sets 
and then perform analysis on those data sets. Now, the thing about those data sets is that once you create them, they're immutable. So I could give Einstein Analytics a bunch of data, and then it's just there, and I can give it another bunch of data, and it's another data set. So what I do is, um, like my pipelines run continuously. So I have a, a, I'm basically, I open a data set and start uploading data to it. And then I can configure a timeout for, okay, after this amount of time, I want to close that data set. And then I start writing another one. But the, the other thing I can do is I can use a data flow to append those data sets together. So in fact, the appearance that you have is of um, an ever-growing data set. And I can show you, um, okay, let's kind of go off without my uh, safety net here. So uh, pipelines, wave, sorry guys, I haven't redone the branding yet. <laughs> so, so this is, so this is, this is actually our tutorial pipeline. And so I'm reading CSV data from a local disk. And if I have a quick look at this data, it is a credit card transaction. This is a, a data set, the New York City taxi data set. And so each record has a medallion number, blah, blah, blah. Payment type is card here, a load of uh, fair amount and so on, pick up and drop off times, um, and a credit card number. So, and it, they're fake credit card numbers, don't worry. So what I do is I split the card from the cash transactions. So we can see that this thing is sending anything with payment type card at the top root, everything else goes along the bottom. So then I've got a bit of Python here that computes the card type. So it's just a little bit of code that looks at this and sees it starts with four, so it's Visa. This one starts with five one, so it's MasterCard. I mask the card number so that because the card number doesn't need to be in Wave, and I send it to Wave Analytics. So um, let's run it. So this is where we go off without the safety net because I haven't tried this recently. So reset, run it. And it's got, I think, about 5,000 uh, records, and it's post processing them in batches of 1,000. So it's really going quite quickly. Um, this is sample data that I use to demonstrate the fact that we can track errors on a on a record by record basis. So some of them have a payment type card, but no credit card data, so <coughs> dirty data. And I'm writing them into Wave, and then if I go to my way for. There's a little bit of latency loading data into Wave, so we'll see if it's arrived already. So, sorry, I'm in Einstein Analytics, it's not called Wave anymore. So, if I go down, yeah, so I can see that data set. Okay, so here's my 5,000, and I can do, um, I can demonstrate my prowess at. Uh, a wave by saying, okay, group got by credit card type and filter, we don't want those not applicable, so filter by what is it, payment type equals card, so that big not applicable line goes away. And if I could remember how I could I could order them most to least, that's the one I can order them. Anyway, so there I can see that my uh, I've got a whole bunch of Visa transactions, but I can also say, okay, what's the biggest average fare? by um, credit card type and it's JCB, so maybe that's a Japanese one, right? Uh, Japanese tourists spend a bunch on taxes. But anyway, so that's, that's those 5,000 records. Um, but also, this uh, tester thing should have run, so hang on, let's refresh here. So I kick off this, um, I kick off the data flow and that aggregates them all together. So I've basically got the same data, I've processed again and again, but I've got the aggregate here of 37,000 rows, because I've run it five times, seven times. Um, and all I'm doing is, I'm manipulating the data flow definition, so I'm, I'm 
writing JSON to say, okay, add this one, add this one, add this one, add this one, so that I give the impression of this ever-growing data set, but it's actually the concatenation of the seven that I've done so far. Did that answer your question? Uh, yes, I guess so. I mean, with, with analytics, you set up your data flow, and then you tell it, okay, every night, I'm going to renew the data flow. So, is it so I'm running it on demand here, which you can do, is it more than 24 times a day now? Yeah. yeah. So you can actually run the data flow, you can actually trigger a data flow programmatically, and that's exactly what I'm doing. Okay. So I, I upload and I say, run it now, because I want to see that. Oh yeah, and if it, yeah, so it's for this, you can you can run this all day long, because if, yeah, there's um, Alex Toussaint, who is the VP of product management for Einstein Analytics, says, uh, if it takes, uh, oops, if it takes uh, less than two minutes, it doesn't even count towards your limits. So I'm just having a look at the configuration here. So, uh, yeah, here we go. Use data flow. So it uses this sales edge data flow. All right, another question. Oh, sorry, just give me a follow-on on Wade. If we want to yeah. go down that. Uh, no, no, you're fine. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask. You've got the Wave guys here. So if you have any other questions. I don't know, they do. Yeah, I was going to ask how you handle updated records. Because you can have a so, yeah, there, there really there, there isn't a good way here. I mean, this is really you're in a mode where more data is arriving and you're just kind of like building like more data lake or whatever. In the general case, it really depends on the uh, destination. So, um, from a lot of our origins, so say um, we've got one for Oracle Logminer, we've got one, the, the streaming API one. You actually know as you you actually get deletes and updates, and if that's the data you're working with, you're probably going to want to use um, a data store like for analytics, like uh, maybe Apache Kudu, something like that, that is actually mutable. Because that's a problem people have with say uh, uh, Hive and you know, Einstein has this as well is that. You can start saying, okay, I'm going to rewrite that data because some of it was updated, so I've got to delete the old one and rewrite the new one. It's a lot, a lot of jumping into the boots. It's possible to do that, but if you're working, if you're working with like the mutable data rather than transactions that are just arriving and more and more arrive, they don't change after the fact, then you probably want to use a different tool. It's like you can't get there. Oh yeah, uh, I'll get to you in a minute, John. Yeah. Question oh. Oh, well, I have two questions. Uh, sure. The first one is, uh, can you do the? Can you inject data into Salesforce? Yeah. With this method, like. Yep. Do you want to see and, it? An XML and then. Yeah. So 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 like just as a fun example, this is actually some functionality I was building in. So I've got a spreadsheet here with. Um, Oh, we can see, okay. So I've got uh, alternating accounts and contacts and just like dummy name, account number, first name, last name. And I've got a uh, pipeline here. Where the Salesforce destination. So I read those in from the disk and I run some Groovy script. And this is just to remove uh, empty fields Salesforce doesn't like those so much. And then I'm writing them into Salesforce. So if I go to here, so <coughs> uh, I've posed myself with uh, multiple logins. So I want to be in my vault. Bear with me just one second. Uh, so if I go here, I should have no, no new contacts this week. And then I can go and I can run this thing. Probably need to reset the thing. Hold on one of these days. Yes. Reset the origin because it knows I've already played with it. Okay, so this should read in 200 records. And it's actually um, 
creating them in uh, both accounts and contacts because I'm what I'm actually doing is saying, okay, in the configuration here, the the type of the S object I'm creating is parameterized, so it's it's coming in from that uh, spreadsheet. And over here, I should have a whole bunch of test uh, contacts. So the really nice thing is, again, this is this is continuous. So this pipeline's running. So I process 200. And if I go over here and say, copy my CSV file in the same directory, because it's using a wildcard, it should pick up the new 200. So it's gone to 400 processed, and then over here my org is even more polluted with uh, yeah. crappy data. Yeah. But yeah. So, so yeah. The the, the, the short answer is um, yeah. We can write any custom or standard uh, S objects. I guess you can not it. Yeah. So the second question is uh, there is well there is different type of license. Salesforce. One is a professional, and then the enterprise. Yeah. The enterprise doesn't let you, the professional doesn't let you uh, inject APEX uh, scripts. You you're gonna need API access. Yeah, because API access. Yeah. But if you, do, you don't need to. Uh, we're not running any APEX. All we're, all we're doing is using bulk or SOAP API okay. to to move data in. So as, so if you've got is, is, does API come with professional, or you can get it as an add-on? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, from Anyway. Yeah, pay. Yeah, if you have if you have API access, this this will run. We, we don't use any APIs. Okay. So you can get API as an add-on to professional, or partners can get it whitelisted. So you get you get it whitelisted with your app. Okay, yeah. So to deploy this into production, I assume we can just spin up a uh, server on some headless uh, server with this? Yeah. So uh, the question is, um, to deploy this into production, can I spin this up uh, somewhere? Yeah. So typically, uh, it, it depends on where your data is coming from. If your data is coming from from Salesforce, then you can yeah you can put it on EC2, uh, somewhere like that. Um, a lot of our customers are working with Hadoop and like on-premise Hadoop, and so that really means like running on the cluster. Now, one thing did I mention? We can run so here we're running actually running on my laptop, and it's running in what we call standalone mode. So it's just a Java application running on my laptop. Um, it's got a stateless API, which is how we're doing this designer stuff. Um, everything I'm doing like through this UI is accessible via the REST API, um, and we, you know, it's basically just reading from local disk, like Salesforce reading from Salesforce right to the Oracle J. We can also run on the Hadoop cluster as technically as a map only job. In, in the MapReduce cluster. So if you're reading from the new file system, you get n instances of stream sets reading in parallel. So we've got a customer, we've got a customer which is a non-US government department, and I can't say more than that, that reads, um, uh, that read a billion records out of Kudu and wrote them to Kudu in an hour and a half. And they just they just had like they just put stream sets it was running across their cluster reading the data from where it was. Uh, the other mode is um, you can run on Spark with Yarn or Mesos. So if you want to read like high performance reading from Kafka, as many Kafka partitions as you have, that many instances run on your Spark cluster. So this thing scales. Thank you, Karen. All day. Yeah. yeah, can I talk about the kind of transformations? In fact, um, I wrote a blog entry on this, which I will use just because it's really <coughs> nice, pretty pictures and examples. So, so the question is, um, what, what transformations I can do? So, 
this is this is pretty key because it's a rare day that you have uh, you know a pipeline as simple as this even with just um, getting rid of empty fields. You often have to shred data, spin it around. So in my example here, I'm calling an API and I'm getting a JSON object that has a results array and it's got two records here. So two company records, two sets of Salesforce. So what I want to do is pivot that into from one record into two. So for every one of those, um, every member of that array, I want to. Oops, is that getting bigger? I don't know. Um, I want to get two actual records. So for every address, I'm pulling them out, and then I want to flatten them down because I've got address with street, city, state, and zip, and that's no good for, say, a relational database. So I want to flatten the record and get, from this hierarchy, I've got, I've got it flat now. And then maybe I want to rename some fields because they don't match the columns in the database, and I want to get rid of this address dot stuff and just have street, city, state, and zip. So I can, I can, re I can go through a number of stages um, and then split the street into a number and name on a space. So here, two Bryant Street goes into two, and then Bryant Street, one Market Street, so on. So I can build these things up and really start to play with this data. Um, these off-the-shelf transformations are very performant because they're just written in Java. So this is like your um, uh, declarative um, applications. They perform very well because un the underlying system is just in Java. You can also uh, drop scripts in. So I have a Groovy script in one of those examples. I have JavaScript or uh, Jython, so Python on the JVM. So you can achieve, and as a test, I tried this out, um, writing it in Groovy, and it processed 400 and some records per second rather than 500. So you can drop into scripts, just like you can drop into Apex on what used to be called force.com, and you get a lot of flexibility and power, but it tends to not perform as well as using the built-in tools that tend to be more maintainable. You know, it's easy to get a sense of what's going on by kind of going along this this thing, rather than looking at some Ruby that's doing it all mashed together in one, uh, you know, in six lines of code. Daniel, sorry, I. I completely blanked you if I were here. <laughs> Audrey questions. Um, so I have two. The first one's a little bit more of a Neo4j question. Uh, when you're visualizing the nodes and the relationships, do you have any control over how those cluster? Because thinking uh, it's doing some nice auto formatting, but maybe yeah. clustering different ways you can get different insights. Uh, that's probably a question, Ryan. Can you control the way that they, they get shown? Uh, you can't control the way that they get shown in terms of the clusters in the Neo4j browser. Uh, with the Neo4j browser, you can control like the coloring based on the labels. So based on what type of nodes they are, you can change the colors and the sizes and things like that. Uh, in terms of the physics of it, um, there are other visualization libraries, uh, D3 and then things built on top of D3, which allow you to change some of the physics. Um, in terms of clustering, uh, we do also have a, a set of algorithms uh, available for Neo4j uh, that allow you to run various different types of clustering algorithms and then you can feed that to your visualization. Um, but you know, the short end is that this is actually built uh, primarily as a developer interface, what you're seeing here in the Neo4j browser, uh, for kind of the, the BI interface and things like that that are third party tools that are curious. Uh, if anyone knows the, the tool Gephi, uh, the, the folks that created Gephi, many people use it in academia especially uh, to do graph analysis, created this thing called the Curious, which is a new project, and it's a great sort of BI platform that has a little bit more control over that. Maybe the next blog post, <laughs> if we're doing chatter data, that would be nice to cluster and label different types of people. Yeah. Uh, the question was just around 
licensing and pricing. It's Neo4j open source, stream sets open source, and not uh, right. So I, I, I can speak for stream sets. So stream sets data collector is Apache 2 open source. Uh, it's on GitHub. You can download. You can download the source and build it. You can download the binaries and use them. Um, there is, uh, you know, enterprise licensing and pricing and talk to our salespeople because they don't make money. Um, Ryan, do you want to do the same? Yeah, so Neo4j is, is completely open source, but the, so there's a community edition which is open source by like GPL. Uh, the enterprise edition is open source, but it's under the AGPL, which is a fairly restricted uh, license, but, you know, we do have offer enterprise licenses for the enterprise edition. Uh, the main difference is, is operational controls. So when he's using the desktop edition uh, or community edition here um, for if you want backup and clustering and HA and things like that, that's where the enterprise edition comes into play. So you can do quite a bit with it without paying money if you don't mind doing all the work yourself. Yeah. No support. Yeah. Um, and uh, well, the, the other thing I should mention with stream sets is so the data collector is open source, that data flow performance manager is a service and that's a that's a paid for it's like basically a management layer for these things. So it tends to be if you're if you're into the into the pipelines enough that you need that, then you tend to be getting value for from them and you know you're willing to pay up for the, the management tool. And that really does let you manage hundreds or thousands of pipelines. You could start saying Okay, I've got a pipeline repository, I can see the changes over time, and I can say, okay, deploy this pipeline to those instances. So you can really get like that higher order thing rather than, you know, the alternative is hit, you know, going to each instance, like with your browser, and have like 10 tabs open, say start pipeline, start pipeline, start pipeline. You just do that in like one click in the performance uh, layer. And we've got some sweet things uh, coming down the line with, uh, with, uh, with that as well, in terms of management of clustering and so on. Yeah. All right, I think, I think it's a wrap. Well, thank you very much for coming. I totally spaced on bringing uh, Schwab, but I do have uh, lovely business cards that uh, I'm prepared to give away to anybody that wants them. So, uh, um, thank you.